Africans, I know of you, is that you became involved in political life in South Africa when you were 15. Tell us why, why, why then, why were you interested in stepping up and getting involved in politics at an early age? Thank you, Amanda. Good evening, everybody. Um, there was a national student uprising against what we called apartheid education. Um, the situation in South Africa at that time was government spent this amount of money on the education of a white child and this amount of money on the education of a black child. So it was very much about trying to address the issue of inequality in education. To be honest, you know, we didn't really know that much at the age of 15. For example, the slogan at the front of the march was, we want equality. By the time the slogan got to the back of the march, the kids were chanting, we want a color TV. <laughs> because, because kids in white schools had color TVs and kids in black schools had no electricity, no TVs. So, and, and you know, if I think about that time, some of the slogans were very interesting. Uh, my favorite was, you pay our teachers peanuts, no wonder they give us monkey education. Uh, but essentially it was to address a thing that impacted on us directly. And I think for many people in South Africa at that time, entering activism, you entered from an issue that impacted in you. And I would say my observations globally is that the best way to get people involved is to start around the issues that matter to people in their day-to-day -day life. So it was, the trigger was the issue of education. I should just say that one of the most chilling statements of apartheid policy was actually about education. The architect of apartheid, Hendrik Verfoot, said, and I quote, blacks should never be shown the greener pastures of education. They should know that the station in life is to be hewers of uh, wood and drawers of water, unquote. So education has always been deeply political in South Africa, and I'd argue that throughout the world, education is deeply political. So, I understand why people were active in South Africa, but why you, Vinny? What was it about your life experience at that point that saw you take <coughs> political risk? Not every, like, I agree, of course, education was present for most of the students, but why, what, what set of factors saw you interested in taking that risk? Was there someone who inspired you at that early age? Was there someone who taught you about justice and politics? Where did you learn that from? Actually, it was my mother who basically taught me the most important things that guide me even today. She always used to say it's much better to try and fail than to fail to try. Uh, she also always said, look for the strengths in other people and the weaknesses in yourself, because that's how you can be a better person. And then one day I remember getting home where a teacher who had made a conversion from one religion to the other was saying that this new religion of his was the best and so on, and it was my favorite teacher. So I get home, I say to mom, you know, this teacher says this religion is the best and so on. My mom said, all religions are the same. And the best religious approach you can have to religion is see God in the eyes of every human being that you meet. I have to say I've adapted that since I've been at Greenpeace. I, I now say we should see God in the eyes of every living thing on the planet. So, so that whole idea, and, and um, sadly, my mom committed suicide a few weeks before this national student uprising started. And so I kind of uh, carried into the, into the struggle uh, a deep sense of that my mom was marching with me. And, you know, I think that people enter struggle for a whole range of different reasons. Sometimes because they read a book that really just changes the perspective on life. Sometimes because it's people they love, like I, with my mother, you get inspired. And sometimes seeing terrible atrocities. And I was seeing terrible atrocities around me all the time, uh, even at that young age. You know, if you took a bus from a black township, whether it was an Indian township, colored township, or a Zulu township, as we had in my city, Durban, you, ha you had to go, going into the center town, you would pass schools with m massive sports fields and big buildings and so on. And the primary school I went to for the first six years had no electricity. It was a, a, what we call a wooden iron school. You know, essentially, it was a 
school that was built with, uh, you know, and it was actually on stilts. I should say that the naughty boys in my class made a hole in the wooden things and they would always drop the pencils and say, ma'am, I dropped my pencil, can I go under and get it? And they sometimes would look up and see some interesting things at the young age. I, I, I have to confess, I didn't do that at all. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're finding out all the way in. Um, but what did you learn from the apartheid movement? That was your training ground as a political activist. What were some of the key lessons that your activism in that movement taught you? Well, the first thing I would say is that if you are an activist trying to change an injustice, that you should not project your consciousness on the people that you're trying to organize. Meaning that, and, and, and we learn from making the mistake, um, making mistakes like, you know, for example, we should be very impatient with some of our elders in our family who would say to us, me and my younger brother, you boys are gonna end up in prison like Nelson Mandela and so on and, and, and you know, and often would say very conservative things and we were just so angry whenever we heard that. And then an older activist said, you know, you need to understand, your parents, the elders and so on, they, have been, they are victims of ideological manipulation and you shouldn't blame them for not actually being progressive. You, if you're an activist that really wants to make change, you must humble yourself, understand where people are, understand where their consciousness is, start from where people are, build on what they know, and get to a point when if you win a victory, that people should say, we have done it ourselves. So that for me is, is the most important lesson I've learned from the early days. The second is that um, history teaches us that whenever humanity has faced a terrible injustice, whether it was slavery, colonialism, women's right to vote, apartheid, civil rights in the United States, these struggles only moved forward when decent men and women said, enough is enough and no more. We prepare to put our lives on the line, we prepare to go to prison if necessary. And so the second lesson is, when the stakes are high, the need for courage is critically important. And Nelson Mandela once said, courage is not the absence of fear, but it is the ability to actually triumph over it. So, you know, even today, I'm scared when, when I take part in certain actions. I was part of the Greenpeace action to occupy a Russian uh, oil rig in the Arctic Sea in 2012. And I can tell you, I was shit scared. Apart from the fact that I'm not a good climber and I fell in the ocean and so on, but that's not a long story. <laughs> uh, but you know, um, but it's, it's saying that the stakes are high enough that sometimes moral courage is critically important. And if I look at what moved me and inspired me, was many brave South Africans who, you know, lost their lives in large numbers. Um, and I would say the third inspiration, final one, uh, was my best friend at, at, at that time, whose name was Lenny Naidu, same surname, no relation. And when we were both kind of fleeing into exile, in different directions in 1987, he asked me a question. He said, Kumi, what is the biggest contribution you can make to the course of humanity? And I said, that's an easy question, giving your life. And he said, you mean going out, participating in a demonstration, getting shot and killed and becoming a martyr? I said, I guess so, because at that time it was happening literally every week we were at funerals in the 1980s, bidding activists. So, my friend Lenny said to me, that's not the right answer. He said, it's not giving your life, but it's giving the rest of your life. Now, I was 22 years old that time. My friend Lenny was way ahead of us. He was the first environmentalist I knew. And I'm pretty sure that at that point, he was probably one of just about a thousand voluntary vegetarians on the entire African continent. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, I shrugged my shoulder, hugged him, and we flew fled into exile in different directions. Two years later, I heard that my friend Lenny and three young women from my home city were brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. There were so many bullets in their bodies that parents couldn't even recognize them at the mortuary. 
So I had to think deep and hard about this distinction between giving your life and giving the rest of your life. Because you know, if you take a guy like Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, if he died, say, five years after he was elected president, history would rem have remembered him as a person who played a key role in the liberation struggle and, and you know, made sacrifices and did the right thing. But 30 years later, he's still in power and has abused that power and so on. So the real, what L Lenny was saying is that the struggle for justice is a marathon, not a sprint. And the biggest contribution we can make is persevering, having the stamina, keep pushing, and never letting uh, defeats actually stop you from continuing to struggle. So I would say those are some of the many lessons that I learned. And the last thing I would say, though, is the one thing that I feel very strongly is successful activism can be sexy and fun, <laughs> right? No, no, I say that quite seriously, actually. Because if I think about uh, you know, how, when we were organizing as young people, we organized around you know, maths classes and Shakespeare lectures and, you know, and fun runs and sporting activities and so on, what in those days we used to call first level organizing. Because understand, we were organizing in a context of extreme repression. The ANC was illegal. You could go for, to prison for 10 years just for being proven that you were a member of the ANC and so on. So when you're organizing in a context of extreme repression, uh, then you also have to think in a very different ways of how you organize and, and, and also ensuring that you, know, you can participate in struggle with love, with even caring about your enemy if you want. Because you know, what Nelson Mandela taught us was that white South Africans was as oppressed as black South Africans ideologically, right? In the sense that white Af South Africans were told a lie, that the system was defendable and, and so on. So um, you know, being able to prosecute the struggle in a way that you celebrate humanity, you celebrate peace, you celebrate uh, love for each other, uh, and, and a sense of community, I think, is critically important. And doing it with fun, and doing it with laughter, and doing it with a sense of you cannot break our spirit. Because you know, when I was in exile in the UK, uh, often people used to ask me, "We don't get you, South Africans." You know, when we switch on the TV, we see all these funerals happening. Sorry, I got a sign there saying "Speak up." Can you hear me? Okay. So. Sorry, what was the last thing I said? About in Britain, oh yes, sorry. <laughs> so I was, you know, people used to always say to me, you know, what's wrong with you South Africans? You'll dance at funerals, you'll sing at funerals, what's with that? And it's very important to understand why we did that. It was saying to the oppressor, you can kill us, you can shoot us, you can detain us, but you can never defeat our spirit, right? And it's also saying that we are here not to mourn only the life that has been taken, but to celebrate that life because it was a life well lived. And, and even though we've lost that person, it was a sacrifice that was going to move our struggle forward. Now I'm going to talk, we're going to talk a little bit later about what the anti apartheid movement now teaches you as a climate change campaigner. But I want to let the audience come on the journey, your journey, because coming to the work of climate change into Greenpeace. Uh, didn't happen straight away after your experience with the apartheid. Where did you travel to politically um, after your experience with this very brutal regime in South Africa? How did your understanding of people power develop in that period, building off your experience? Well, Nelson Mandela was released in February 1990. I was on a Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford at that time. and. He was released in February 1990. I was home in March 1990 because I was one of the people who was asked to go back home quickly to help build the Mandela's movement and prepare it as a legal political party to contest the elections. And in the process of doing that, I discovered that, in fact, um, there's a big difference <laughs> between participating in a liberation struggle and preparing to actually capture power, right? 
and uh, why don't you go through some of the differences? Well, during during the liberation struggle, the logic was very different. The logic was give, 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 right? Even poor people, you know, would put their hands in the pockets, take out the last cents they had, and put on the table to print a pamphlet or hire a bus to a rally, uh, and so on. Sadly, suddenly, when the transition was happening, uh, the new logic was wow, I need to position myself for this position and that position and, and, and so on. And so actually what we had was an ex exodus of people from the NGO community into government. And I used to jokingly say, actually the term NGO in our context after the election didn't stand for non-governmental organization, but stood for next government official. Because so many people had moved you know, across, which was not a bad thing, because at least at one level you could say the NGO community in South Africa during the anti-apartheid period was probably the most important human resource development agency collectively. So the, the other difference, I think, so, so, so then there was a question you know, about what, how does civil society, NGOs, trade unions, churches, and so on, relate to the new democratic state? So obviously, you know, I knew three quarters of the cabinet, the first cabinet, because you know I was involved in the in this in the struggle. And, and oh, sorry, I should tell you, I had to make a very important. I was say, why did you not become a senator yeah. like the rest of your mates? Eh? Well, well, actually, uh, the person who recruited Nelson Mandela into the struggle was a person called Walter Sisulu. Can I just check how many of you know the name Walter Sisulu? Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Walter Sisulu was an amazing, amazing man, right? And I was asked. Uh, because I was working in adult education then, and I chose to work in adult education because of the fact that most of our people were left completely educationally disenfranchised, and most of them, when the ballot form was going to be presented to them, will not be able to read it, right? So for me, addressing the educational deficit, and people power starts with people having the ability to actually engage in public conversation, and the reason that the apartheid state and some other states around the world educationally disenfranchise is because they know that that's how you can limit people's ability to participate in public life. So, uh, so I got, I still have the letter from Walter Sisulu asking me to come and head up the ANC's media division in preparation for the elections. And then I have a mentor, a wonderful woman called Mary Makonazi from Durban. Who was, the, who was a domestic worker for most of her life and became the organizer of the South African Domestic Workers Union. Any of you, any trade unionists here? Okay, so the trade unionists will know that the two most difficult sectors to organize is domestic workers and farm workers. And domestic workers is particularly hard because each of the employers are individuals, right? You know, it's, it's very difficult. So I went to see Aunt Mary because at the same time I was approached to head up the National Adult Literacy Coalition, right? And so I go see Aunt Mary and I say, Aunt Mary, you know, what is this, you know, Baba Sisulu wants me to do this big job at the ANC and I've been asked to head up this Adult Literacy Coalition which had four dollars in the bank account, equivalent, and a big vision but no resources and so on. And, and I said, what do you think I should do? She said, my boy, whether the ANC has a media division or don't have a media division, they're going to win this election. <laughs> if you, even if you went there and tried to screw it up, they'll still win the election. <laughs> so if you want to be famous, be on TV and all, go do that. If, and she, then she said, if you say no to the ANC, there'll be a thousand other people who want to do that job. But who's going to do this adult literacy job? And I urge you to do that. And so I took her advice and I took her advice of another trade union activist who I respect a lot. Um, who, who, ad, who, who, who advised me in this direction. And I'm so grateful, actually, uh, to them for helping me make that choice. Because the conventional thing to do would have been, and, and also, the request didn't just come from Walter Su. The request came on a Friday by a person called Chris Hani, who was one of the most respected people in our liberation struggle when he came to the office of our adult education office. On Friday, he made the request, and on the Monday, he was assassinated. Um, and so 
So it was hard for me to actually say no in the context of a request that was made by Chris Hani. And so... How did that choice uh, inform or um, was informed by your growing understanding of people power? Because that's a, that's a political yes. decision, yeah. right, in terms of how power is exercised. So basically, I think the big problem we have, which I saw then, is that we often are placing too much of faith and trust in political institutions that are malfunctioning, that are weak, and that often are actually uh, prone to corruption. Right? That doesn't happen in Australia. Yeah, no, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously have been fully <laughs> so, uh, so, for a healthy, vibrant democracy, we need healthy, vibrant civil society. That, in fact, and the term, so, so you know, the ANC, once the ANC got elected, then understandably, the leadership said, listen, we are trying to reverse decades and decades and decades of injustice. It's going to take time. We're not going to do it overnight. And so the question was, how does civil society react and re relate to a government that delivered liberation? And so some of us coined the phrase that our approach is that of critical solidarity, that we were in solidarity with the government that actually delivered uh, our freedom, but it had to be critical. And to the argument of government saying, we need time, we said, that's fine, but if we see government going in that direction, when in fact we think government should go in this direction, we're not going to give you time to actually proceed in the wrong direction. We're going to block you there and try and shift you. So within two years of democracy, we were waging campaigns against the ANC on certain policies that we were taking, and we, and we were able to, to win and shift the ANC on some issues back on track. And that happened because people didn't, at the early stages of our democracy, it's changed somewhat now, people didn't believe that democracy should be reduced to the singular act of voting once every four or five years and in your case, ridiculously, one every three years. I mean, it's a ridiculous system you'll have. Because, I mean, the moment they get elected, they're thinking about the next election rather than governing properly. I mean, you have three years, every three yeah, years, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a, I'm not sure if they're ever really thinking about governing properly, but it's a nice thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so people power is I'm a... Ask, I mean, I know, sorry. Yeah, no problem. I, I, you were very involved in setting up a network of NGOs in South Africa and then moved... So I'm giving you quick notes. They um, they moved to set up be part of Civicus, which is doing that sort of global civil society work. How did your organising help cultivate that understanding of critical solidarity? Because that idea of that idea is not naturally occurring, right? We don't necessarily have that operating in Sydney civil society, where there's a recognition that it's critical that they, we respect political leadership, but we need to be critical and constantly pushing. Were there particular strategies you used to cultivate that kind of understanding? Well, you know, we, it was quite a weird situation we found ourselves in once the new government was elected because we had no access before to engage with the previous regime. And even if we did, even if they invited us, we wouldn't necessarily go and participate. So, you know, we had, in fact, we, we, we all were suffering from a terrible disease, those of us who stayed out uh, and, and continued to civil society and, the, and the, the health problem that we were suffering from we called consultation fatigue. Because every ministry, every other government department was inviting you and was like, and to be honest, a lot of us got caught up in the moment of it. You know, suddenly, you know, we were, we were sitting in the, ca you know, even being at cabinet meetings in some cases and so on. And power is a very intoxicating thing, right? Even if you're not actually exercising it. So part of what we had to do is to make sure that people understood that we will engage with government and support them when they're doing the right thing, but we will reserve the right to be critical mm -hmm. and to actually oppose government when in fact they are actually violating the mandate which they actually ran the election on and 
on what they promise people. It's not an easy thing to do. Well, it sounds like a culture of accountability. Absolutely. And not only accountability outside, but accountability inside the movement to be able to hold such a position. And I'm drawing these things out because I'm, I'm wanting to explore with you after we talk about why you became the head of Greenpeace, how all these early lessons teach us to, to work on climate change now and what these principles, how these principles apply. But let's jump forward. So you were, you were headhunted to come into this extraordinary role as the international head of Greenpeace, not as uh, someone who had done massive campaigns on environmental issues, in some ways as an outsider. Why did you say yes? Oh, that's a very simple answer. My daughter didn't give me a choice. <laughs> now, seriously, Greenpeace approached me when I was uh, uh, in the middle of a hunger strike to put uh, uh, pressure on the South African government not to slavishly support the Mugabe government in Zimbabwe. And after many, many years of struggle to try to get our government to understand that if we owed a debt in Zimbabwe, we didn't owe it to Mugabe and the government in power, that we owed it to the Zimbabwean people as a whole, right? And so, and our government was resisting that for a whole range of reasons. And so Archbishop, I, I went underground into Zimbabwe in December of 2008, and what I saw was horrifying. Lives were being lost, bodies were piling up in cemetery, in, in uh, uh, mortuaries and so on. And I came back quite traumatized and went and spoke to Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Grasha Michelle, who spoke to Mandela and so on. And I said, we need to do something different, and we launched this rolling hunger strike uh, and fast, and it was called the Save Zimbabwe Now campaign. And so Greenpeace approached me on the 19th day, and I'd been only on water for 19 days. So, so you were delirious. <laughs> so, so I said, you sure you're calling the right person? I don't know too much about the environment. <laughs> so that evening, my daughter, who saw me on television in the UK, on BBC, she called and said, Dad, I've just seen you, you're looking like a skeleton, I'm getting really worried, and why are you still doing these interviews? Shouldn't you be conserving your energy? I said, no, darling, I only spoke to you, and I spoke to these Greenpeace people because it was a long distance call from Amsterdam to Joburg. And she asked me, what did they say? I told her, what did you say? I said, I told them, thanks very much, I'm deeply honored, but it's not very good timing for me to make such a big decision <laughs> to, you know, to be a candidate. And then she said to me, Dad, I will not talk to you <laughs> if you don't consider this seriously when you finish your stupid hunger strike. <laughs> so I said, I was quite taken aback. And even though I was kind of weak and all at that time, I said, what are you talking about? And she said, you know, for somebody who claims to be educated, it is pathetic, right? She was 16 then. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's pathetic. Yeah how you don't understand how my future and my generation's future is threatened by climate change. And I said, yeah, I know climate change is a problem. She said, yeah, but you don't really know that in fact our future is at, and then she said, and Greenpeace is not like many organizations that talk, 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 but Greenpeace has guts and is prepared to put their, uh, activists are prepared to put their lives on the line and so on. And she said, you know, knowing you, Greenpeace will suit you. <laughs> so then I said, okay, and thankfully, 10 days later, the search company called me back and said, are you eating again? I said, yeah, I'm on liquids now, and I have a little more energy. And then they said, will you consider? I said, yeah, I know my daughter has given me an ultimatum. But, you know, I, I choose to tell the story because I could, uh, there are a thousand reasons why I would say yes to the approach because Greenpeace is uh, my... my feeling at that time was one of the most precious global assets that we had, right? And that feeling has not changed at all. If anything, it's been strengthened. But I choose to tell the story that the main reason I did it was because of my daughter. Because, you know, this struggle is not about saving the planet. The planet actually does not need saving. Because if we continue the way we are and we continue to warm the planet the way we do, we will be gone the planet will still be here. It will be bruised, battered, and scarred by humanity's crime. And actually, once we are gone, the forests will recover, the oceans will replenish, and so on. Don't worry about the planet. 
This struggle is fundamentally about whether humanity can fashion a way to coexist with nature in a mutually dependent relationship for centuries and centuries to come. Put differently, put, put differently, this struggle is fundamentally about protecting our children and their children's futures. And so that was the reason I, I joined. And then also the other reason why I choose this story, because I want to say to people in all walks of life, if the current head of Greenpeace had to have his daughter kick his butt to understand that he needs to get involved in climate change, then it's not too late for anybody anywhere to join this fight right now. Because we're not going to win this fight unless all parts of society get actively involved with passion, with courage, and with real energy. Fantastic. So you were a different leader for Greenpeace. What did you want to do differently in that space? How did, like, what, when you started in this role, it was uh, November 2009, is that right? Yes. Yeah. What did you want to do differently? Well, you know, I must say that, and I see a few <coughs> South African friends in the audience, and they can confirm this for me. You're from South Africa, right? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, you know, sorry, I completely lost my talk there. <laughs> this is a sleep deficit uh, problem. Can you ask the question? Yeah, please. I was just going to say, what did you want to do differently? Ah, yeah. You're a different leader. So, so, the first thing, you know, you need to understand growing up in apartheid South Africa, environmentalism was what rich people and white people did, right? And because the majority of white South Africans actually treated the pets better than they respected black people, right? So, so growing up in that society, you had sort of like a negative kind of take on environmentalism. You know, it was like a thing that you did if you were okay when you had food in your stomach and a roof over your head and so on. But what I learned as in my role as the chair of the global campaign against poverty for several years is that actually poverty was being exacerbated by environmental destruction. And that in fact the struggle to end global poverty and the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change can, must and should be seen as two sides of the same coin. So that was the one main thing that I was trying to bring into Greenpeace. The second is, while it's important that we build on the tradition of nonviolent direct action and the iconic protest that Greenpeace does, I wanted to change and bring and uh, consolidate that, but bring some additionality. So, for example, just a couple of weeks ago, some of you might have seen a protest that we did in Portland uh, uh, to try to block Shell's uh, ship that's going to drill in the Arctic. And the difference with that was that we had 12 activists who were there hanging down, blocking the ship. But on the shore, there was about 500 people saying, we are with those people. They are part of us. Because it doesn't serve Greenpeace or any activist movement if people see Greenpeace as, oh, wow, those are such brave, courageous uh, people willing to put their lives on the line. Because then people then can't see themselves as part of the movement. It's only a handful of people who's going to learn how to climb and so on. And the idea was to have a Greenpeace where people can contribute in multiple different ways. If you're good on social media, that could be a way you can contribute. If you're a person living with disabilities and cannot leave your home often, you can actually be a cyber activist. You know, and so that's the kind of Greenpeace that we have been trying to build. And, and, and so essentially, the whole notion is to become a more people-centric organization. Mm -hmm. um, Almost like you're democratizing direct action. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not without its uh, challenges, you know, because sometimes, you know, when you, because one of the things about some of the actions that we do, we have to plan it carefully, execute it, and so on, and make sure that the cops don't know that we are about to do it. I mean, what we do is, the moment we execute the action, we're on the phone to tell the police, we are Greenpeace, this is peaceful, you know, calm down, right? Uh, but, We've had occasions sometimes where, you know, we arrive there and with 50 activists doing an action, there's 500 police waiting for us, right? So, but those things happen really. And the additionality of bringing more and more people into was another. The, the third big change that 
uh, not that I brought to the organization, it was already there, but needed to be given a further boost, was to recognize that if we don't win in the global south, right, meaning in developing countries, we lost. If every developed country, right, tomorrow decides to be zero carbon, right, and makes it happen magically, say, within two weeks. Um, we are fine with that. <laughs> And if we don't win in China, we don't win in India, we don't win in Indonesia, we don't uh, win in Brazil, where we're talking about substantial population sizes, then we will lose, right? So, so that was the other thing, because, you know, the reality is all the contradictions of power, differential power between rich and poor nations, manifest themselves in global civil society. It's, you know, but it's important, though, to recognize that and look at how we, as Mahatma Gandhi once said, be the change we want to see in the world, right? To, to actually be different. So we've made lots of progress in terms of equalizing power between, if you want, developed and developing countries. Uh, so those were some of the key things. And then I also wanted to mainly address the issue. Any, any feminists in the audience? Is there here? Okay. Good. Let me ask you this. Um, do the feminists in the audience remember a word called intersectionality? Okay, so the feminist movement gave us decades ago a very powerful concept but a terrible word, intersectionality, <laughs> which basically said that if you want to advance gender equality, you needed to know how gender intersected with race, class, ability, religion, and so on. And that's one of the things that we are trying to do. It's, we will be an environmental organization. That's what we are. And we, we won't deviate from that. But to be a good environmental organization is to understand how environmentalism intersects with gender issues, with, uh, how does it intersect with uh, peace, uh, and so on. And, and the economy. And the, uh, of course, and, and the economy. And, and let me just take one issue, right? Uh, and some of you who know my background will be surprised how I'm going to start the next sentence. I strongly support the CIA and the Pentagon <laughs> when in 2002 they presented a report to George W. Bush saying that in the coming decades the biggest threat to peace, security and stability will not come from terrorism, will not come from conventional threats, but will come from the impacts of climate change. And in my continent, Africa, even though our continent as a collective, my country is a different story, but our country as a collective, our continent as a collective, has been least responsible for emissions and so on, but we are paying amongst the first and most brutal price for climate impacts. The genocide in Darfur will be understood as the first major resource war brought about by climate impacts because Lake Chad, one of the largest inland seas in the world, according to Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General has shrunk to a size of a pond, so water scarcity, and then the Sahel Desert from, runs from Senegal to Sudan is marking southwards annually at the rate of almost a mile a year, right? So land scarcity, water scarcity, combining giving you the toxic mix of food scarcity was the trigger that allowed opportunistic politicians to manipulate identity to actually give us that horrific chaos and tragedy that we had. So understanding how environmentalism intersects with poverty with gender equality. And we know, I would say, climate change is fundamentally a women's issue and a feminist issue. Why? Because if the CIA and Pentagon is right, which I would say they are, we know that in every conflict, right, and every war, women and children pay the biggest price in terms of suffering. So, and, and that's why you see today the women's movement is more and more actively involved in the, in, in the climate struggle. So what's been the hardest thing? What's been the greatest challenge running Greenpeace globally at this time where getting the world to take climate change seriously has been so challenging? I think Greenpeace has been winning major battles with major companies, with major... Um, in, and also getting government policy to change in many places. But the biggest challenge is that I think we're brutally honest, and I believe, 
as Amilka Cabral, one of the leaders of the anti-colonial movement in, in Africa, West, uh, West Africa, used to say, good activism is about telling no lies and claiming no easy victories, right? And if we are brutally honest, we would say as Greenpeace, we are winning many big battles, but we're losing the overall war because we got a clock that is ticking on climate and we are running out of time. Some would say for many parts of the world, I mean, for the people of Taklaban, for example, in, in Philippines, who got hit by that Typhoon Haiyan, it's too late for those people. They've lost their lives, they've lost everything, right? So, so the question for us is, what we're struggling with is how do we have accelerated change strategies? And so, for example, when we take on the Galilee Basin Carmichael project, one thing that we are doing these days is to give us that accelerated progress is not only going after the company, we're going after the money, right? So all the banks that still are thinking about funding Adani and the Carmichael project, yay it from us here today loud and clear, we are coming after you and we are going to make sure that you will receive fierce resistance so that you cannot justify lending people's money to institutions that are going to destroy people's capability to actually live a decent, prosperous and, and, and a sustainable life in the future. So what about for us in Australia? You know, you've been here for a, for a little while, you've seen our, our political leadership on this issue, or lack thereof. Um, what messages or, or what, what would you, if you had to sit down with your fellow Rhodes Scholar mate, Tony Abbott, <laughs> um, what would you say? Would you uh, I would say, firstly, who did you buy your Rhodes Scholarship from? <laughs> no, seriously. Seriously. Both are boxing. <laughs> yeah. So then, um, I, I would say the first thing to Prime Minister Abbott, who claims to be a devout Catholic, I would say to him, read the Pope's encyclical that was released last month. Read it and tell me whether you can claim to be a devout Catholic. I am totally impatient now with those that use religion to advance their political standing in society, when in fact every religious text, whether it's the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, the Bhagavad Gita, and so on, if you pick it up, there are gems of environmental wisdom in it. And for those who believe that God exists and believe in, in religion, then you surely do not believe that God only created us, but God created the mountains, the rivers, the oceans, and so on. And so, you know, when the previous Pope was there in the Vatican, I was in Rome uh, campaigning with our colleagues in the Greenpeace Italian office, you know, for, um, on a nuclear referendum, which we won, and nuclear is dead in um, Italy since. But when I was on this television show, I, I said, you know, I, we should challenge the Pope. I said, I challenge the Pope in a gentle challenge and all other religious leaders because they should come before us and say to us, you know, ask us a simple question. Folks, those of you who believe in God, do you think God is so cruel? Because if you believe in God, then God presumably knew that humanity needed energy. And so do you think God scratched his head and said, ah, these buggers are going to need energy. Let's see what I'll do. I'll take the coal, I'll put it deep in the ground, <laughs> take the oil, put it deep in the ocean, deep in the ground, same with gas, so they have to kill themselves trying to get to it, and in the process, destroy a range of things that humanity <laughs> needs for their survival. And the religious leaders should come and say, folks, you all are making a big mistake. You all have been looking in the wrong direction. Rather than looking down for oil, coal, and gas, you should look up and see, I gave you the sun and the wind to meet your energy needs. <laughs> now, if you... <laughs> Just one caution. If you use that analogy, just be careful because there will always be some clever person who will say, geothermal also comes from below. <laughs> so you should say we should primarily be looking up <laughs> rather than down. So, 
So, so yeah, I, I mean, I think that we are seeing a shifting narrative, and, and the good news is that we have won the argument, right? Nobody today, like George W. Bush for eight years said climate change is not caused by humans, right? Today, even Tony Abbott does not say that climate change is not real, but the reality is our political and business leaders are suffering from an acute case of cognitive dissonance. Okay, for those of you who don't know the term, I also learned it not very long ago. Uh, so I'll give you an example rather than give you a definition. You remember that moment when the American troops eventually got to Baghdad during the illegal war in Iraq in terms of international law? And Saddam Hussein's communications minister was still doing press conferences. And so the journalists were asking him, so Mr. Minister, how long do you think you will withstand American firepower? And do you think you can survive this war? And so on. And he stood there and said, what war? We are in firm control. We got everything under control. And behind him, buildings are burning, bombs are dropping, even as he's giving the press conference. And that is the attitude of our political and business leaders to the issue of climate change. We have already broke so many barriers. My sister there, Coretti, is the coordinator of the 350.org in the Pacific region. That organization is called 350.org because 350 was con is considered the safe concentration. It's 350 parts per million carbon concentration in the atmosphere, and that was known to be the safe limit. And the first Earth Summit in 1992, we were under 350, right? We were about 310. Two years ago, two years ago, we overshot 400 parts per million. The last time the planet had 400 parts per million carbon concentration, the Arctic was completely ice-free, Africa was covered with savanna forests, and uh, sea level was at least 15 to 20 meters higher. Right? That's one. The second thing is, you know, how many of you, when you think about climate, have heard this figure at two degrees? Just Raise your hands. Good, most of you. OK, just to be clear, when we talk about that, it's saying from the beginning of the industrial period, when we started burning oil, coal, and gas, that from that period into the future, we cannot have more than two degrees of warming. How many of you know where we are from zero to two degrees already? Almost halfway. We had 0.8 degrees. And at 0.8 degrees in the last decade, we've had more than a 100% increase in extreme weather events. So Mr. Abbott and the political leadership here and the leaders of all countries, developed and developing, must understand that the success, that what is at stake here is not they're not going to get away with baby steps in the, direction, in the right direction. They're not going to get with incremental tinkering, that it's going to be a significant, fundamental societal transformation that we need. For one, we have to move from an economy that's driven by dirty brown fossil fuel-based energy to an economy that's driven by clean, green, renewable-based energy. That's not what's going to do it on its own. We have to question the issue of consumption, because let me say that if, for example, Everybody in the world, given that we're in Australia, let me just use Australia as an example. If everybody in the world has to have the level of consumption as people in Australia have, according to our friends in WWF, we would need between five and eight planets. Right? Already we're living as if we are on one and a half planets because our level of consumption is taking too much of the, away from the planet uh, and not giving it enough time to replenish. So I would say to Prime Minister Abbott that you need to understand that democracy was meant to balance the wallet with the ballot, meaning that the power of rich people was supposed to be equalized by the voices of ordinary people. And the bottom line is that the reason we're not making this change is too many of our political leaders are actually acting in the interests of a handful of powerful corporations which they have mortgaged their souls to 
and that they are not exercising the basic notion of democracy. Because yes, the Adanis in the, of the world are going to make huge amounts of money. And the reason we're not making the transition is clear now that in fact we can meet our energy needs through clean renewable energy is because those that are making truck loads of money every single day are resisting and are holding us back and that is not what democracy is about. In too many countries we have the form of democracy without the substance of democracy. I would describe today many countries that claim to be democracies as simply liberal oligarchies. Yeah. They are not genuine democracies. take for us to bring our democracy back? What kind of people power, people movement is needed for that dramatic transformation that you've talked about? And how do all of your experiences from anti-apartheid on instruct you about what is required for the climate movement in the next five years? Well, firstly, we have to understand that we are in an emergency situation. We have to understand that we do not have time to waste. We have wasted too much of time already. Secondly, we need to understand that the scale of societal transformation we are talking about is not going to be happen, is not going to happen with just the environmental movement standing up and pushing the envelope. It requires religious leaders to step forward, and thankfully, they've been very late, uh, but better late than never, and let's hope they are not too late. Uh, we need religious leaders, trade unions, and, and let me tell you, my biggest hero, or shiro, is an Australian woman called Sharon Barrows, who was the head of the ACTU. And she's now the first woman to be leading the global trade union movement. And in a meeting, for example, with Ban Ki-moon during Rio Plus 20, where we were pushing on climate, she was, I'm not simply saying this to be modest, she was the most eloquent person on climate change in that meeting, and you could see the Secretary General looking at his notes trying to see, is this a Greenpeace person or is this a trade union person? <laughs> and then she said, Mr. Secretary General, you might be wondering why me as a trade unionist I'm so passionate about climate, because she said as a human being, as a parent, and as a trade unionist, I realize there are no jobs on a dead planet, right? So, so part of building it is building real alliances. But what we need is, what Greenpeace is calling a billion acts of courage, right? We need to understand, and the main first act of courage is actually believing that another world is possible, another more just, more equitable world is possible, and even though it will be tremendously difficult to build it, we can. Another part of it is for us to question some of the basic assumptions we make about what constitutes a good, decent, happy life. And we have been completely led astray by an aggressive marketing industry and by big capital who have got us to believe that happiness comes from bigger houses, bigger cars, bigger this, more this, more, more, more. And actually, in reality, it is a fundamental statement of absolute spiritual poverty when in fact we can tolerate societies where the gap between the rich and the poor is so big. So we have to create spaces for people to participate. And part of it is getting our uh, sp uh, musicians to start becoming part of the struggle, getting our theater writers, our artists, and getting our sports stars involved. And I'm hoping somebody was a number 37 jersey will also join the struggle. Uh, and I should say as a South African, I've been appalled to see this happening in modern day Australia, appalled. Uh, that, uh, that's a, you know, it's not a side issue. It is about how we actually, uh, and, and one last thing I want to say, understand this, countries that claim to promote democracy, like Australia, US and so on, are failing us terribly. Because when you have the kind of repression trade unionists are facing in the Australia right now, you giving a blank check to countries with weaker traditions of democracy, say, well, oh, if the United States is doing torture, 
uh, Guantanamo Bay, racial and religious profiling, surveilling people and so on, and they are democracies, so we can actually do the same and understand that the conduct of countries that claim to be promoters of democracy are more saying to us in the developing world, do as we ask you to do, but don't do as we do. And, they need, and you need to understand that that has to be part of the struggle. We will not win the struggle if we do not constantly try to recover our democracy while trying to push for climate solution as well as all the other struggles around gender equality, social equity, and so on. And that's sort of part of the intersectionality you're talking totally. about. Totally. Yeah. I just kept thinking about refugees yeah. sitting in concentration camps and that that actually is connected to this issue. And so sorry, I can't resist saying this. One of the worst things that I heard that happened this year is Tony Abbott paying people smugglers to actually take people back. That is a crime and I, if international law was applied in an equitable way where rich country governments had the same vulnerability as poor country governments when they screw up, I believe that act should be before the International Criminal Court. That's where it belongs. I just want to have a, a, a couple of wrap-up questions. You know, the, the prospects of climate change are pretty devastating. It's, it's hard to imagine how you know, <clears throat> we're going to do all this work to make things change. But how optimistic are you about the future? We don't have a choice but to be optimistic. You know, I've spoken at so many meetings now, I hope I'm not repeating myself. <laughs> So I was speaking to a group of environmental foundations in the United States some years ago, and I went on all the environmental statistics, how you know, our oceans could be dead in 40 years because of overfishing, dumping of toxics, including oil spills, and uh, ocean acidification because the excess carbon is going into the ocean and making our ocean acid. That's one of the impacts on the Great Barrier Reef and other reefs. Uh, on forests, as we sat here this evening, every two seconds, uh, a forest the size of a football field would have disappeared, uh, and so on. And so I was going all these statistics, and especially on climate, and at the end of the speech, uh, a woman put up her hand and said, uh, Dr. Naidu, have you heard of Martin Luther King? And I said, yes, of course, he was a major inspiration in my life. And then she said, do you know what his most famous speech was called? And I said, I, Martin Luther King's most famous speech? I have a dream, so, but, I, but I, somehow I thought it was a trick question, so I was a bit tentative, and I said, I have a dream, and then she shouted back at me, yes, it was I have a dream, and when you speak, it sounds like you have a nightmare. <laughs> Every, everything is collapsing around you. So the challenge, the challenge of leadership now is we cannot lie to people. We have to tell people how serious the issues are, how serious things are, but we have to do it in an optimistic way. The sad truth is, Given that every year now, according to Kofi Annan's foundation, 500,000 people are dying from direct climate impacts. So for those people, it's too late. Right? Let's be clear. Every year now, billions in infrastructure are being lost. And that, it's too late. So understand for some people, it's already too late. We've lost too many lives already. Right? But we are still in a window that is fast closing, where we can still, if we act with courage, secure this planet for the majority of the people. And that's what we need to actually do. And while we do that, we need to actually look at how we actually support the most vulnerable people on this planet. Those, ironically, who are paying the first and most brutal price from climate impacts are those that actually are the lowest uh, uh, emitters of carbon. That's why you will hear this term climate injustice a lot of the time. And so I'm optimistic that we can secure this planet for human survival for centuries and centuries to come, provided that we have the capability of inspiring more than a billion acts of courage to think differently, to act differently, to, and to get people involved, and including sadly, not sadly, Critically, we have to engage in peaceful civil disobedience because 
all our political and business leaders, with few exceptions, all seem to sadly have the same you know, medical problem, which is that they all have a problem hearing, and somehow they seem to hear us best when we engage in acts of civil disobedience. And we have to see an explosion of civil disobedience, peaceful, purposeful, creative, innovative, if we are going to actually get our governments and business leaders to change. Fantastic. So just a, just a final um, question. Many of us in the room have been involved in social change. Many of us um, uh, for many years. You've been involved since you were 15 years old. You, know, you talked earlier that it's not a sprint but a marathon. How do you keep yourself motivated to keep up the struggle even though things are hard? Well, for me, I think about my friend Lenny a lot and what he taught me, you know, about... But what I often think is, you know, even if we are going to fail, I'm not, I'm not going to let them get away without a fight, right? That's one thing. I, I want to be able to look at any young person who says to me, when the science was clear in 1992 already, that we need to act on climate change. Did you act? Did you do everything that was possible to secure this planet for us and, 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 and our generation? We must be able to say, yes, we did. And hopefully we'll be able to say, we did and we changed it and we secured your futures. But even if we're not going to win, I'm being realistic, we do not have an ethical or moral choice not to actually fight as hard as we can. Secondly, I believe the solutions are at hand. And that's where my kind of optimism comes. We are seeing explosion of renewable energy, even though there is so many restrictions on, you know, they always say, uh, government leaders and businesses say, yeah, but solar and wind is so expensive and coal and well, so on the streets. just don't like the look of these towers. <laughs> <laughs> but understand this. The oil, coal, and gas industry currently receives trillions of dollars of taxpayer-funded subsidies. But when you put it cumulatively over time, I don't know, gazillion dollars of taxpayer subsidies. And that notwithstanding that, we see solar reaching parity. We see wind uh, expanding. We're seeing biomass, uh, geothermal, uh, and so on. And here's the beauty of it. I think it's within human creativity, ingenuity, and innovation that we can turn the crisis of climate change into an opportunity. Because we have lived in a world far too long of division between North and South, East and West, rich and poor, developed and developing. The reality of climate change is that we have to come to our senses that, in fact, we either get this right as rich and poor countries acting together and we secure the future, of all our children. If we don't, yes, it's true, it's unfair that developing countries who contributed uh, the least, such as Kiribati, where we are going to meet with the president on Monday, uh, are the ones that will go first. But ultimately, rich countries will also be impacted. The other uh, opportunity is that if we did this right, we can have a win not only for the environment, but also for the economy. And multiple, multiple studies are showing now that, in fact, the best opportunity we have of refreshing our economy, getting more people into jobs and so on, is by engaging in a massive energy revolution that brings people into a new industry, in the new renewable technology industries. And we are seeing that happening all over the world right now. But we need to see it scaled up on a much, much higher level. So, Solutions are there. The problem is political will is missing. And political will, I believe, is the most renewable of all resources. <laughs> and it is up to us to make sure that political will, to act in the interest of not only current generations, but also future generations, is announced to the point where not making the changes will be completely criminal and will not be accepted with, by working class people, by middle class people, and by even those at the very top of society in economic terms.
just before everyone leaves, I know that they're just before everyone leaves, <laughs> before the rest of you leave, I, I know that there are some Greenpeace people in the room. Is, uh, is that right? Is it people, what are they called? Front enders, back doors? <laughs> Front <laughs> liners. So, let me just say that uh, part of the struggle of uh, keeping our movement moving forward is ensuring that we keep our independence and autonomy so that I can go and David Ritter and his team can go into a meeting with the captains of industry in this country and not have money contaminate the relationship, meaning that Greenpeace doesn't take a single cent from government or business. It even allows us, and certainly has allowed me, to actually stand last week with the CEO of the seventh largest energy company in the world, NL, who, while we had 10 court cases going on at the same time, you know, against us, but this very company, we have turned the first fossil fuel company around where they made a commitment. They will not invest a single cent in oil, coal, gas, or nuclear moving forward, and that they will begin to phase out all their uh, fossil fuels over time. There's a difference of opinion we still have about how fast they can do that. And all the investment is going into renewable energy, smart grids, batteries, storage, and so on. And so we would not be able to engage authentically in that conversation if money contaminated that relationship. So for us, relying on small, regular, monthly contributions by individual citizens around the world is a critical part of allowing us to have that independence and autonomy. And uh, this is the hardest part of my job. <laughs> I invite you, if you feel so moved, to support the great work that my colleagues are doing here in Australia Pacific by choosing to become a regular supporter, volunteer, or activist of Greenpeace here in Australia Pacific. We would welcome your time, your energy, your creativity, your innovation, and of course, if you have money, we will welcome that as well. sort of traverse from South Africa to, to the battles of climate change, to your message to Tony Abbott. I know I feel like I've got a sense of what we need to do in the next few years to stop climate change and to carry that optimism that you've had in that role into our activism in Australia, the change we're going to make over the next few years. So thank you. If everyone could just go with me and thank you. So much. Thank you.